Okay, so magandang hapon po sa lahat. Okay. Hello everyone. Welcome to the 87th installment of the Intramuros Learning Sessions. And for today, we will have a very special guest to walk us through the foodscape of Colonial Manila. So April of every year is designated as the Buwan ng Kalutong Pilipino or the Filipino Food Month in acknowledgement of what the proclamation calls, I quote, our vast culinary traditions and treasures which should be appreciated, preserved, and promoted. So in participation to this celebration of our food heritage, the Intramuros Administration through the Center for Intramuros Studies brings you ILS 87 entitled Feeding Manila Colonial Influences on Filipino Food with our esteemed guest speaker, Feliz Prudente Santa Maria. Before we head to this mouth-watering presentation, let me brief you again with our house rules with some modifications for this session. So, okay, for Zoom attendees, you may raise your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of our screen, while for those viewing us via Facebook Live, you may raise your questions in the comment section. If you wish to remain anonymous, please let us know or you may opt to change your display name. And for this session, we will have a different setup. So we will have two Q&A se sessions. So we encourage everyone to send in their questions as we go along. So no need to wait for the end of both lectures before you send in your questions as we have a Q&A session in between the presentation. And also, please be reminded that only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate. A feedback form will be emailed to you after the session and the certificate will be sent within a week. And finally, please note that this webinar is recorded and the recording shall be made permanently available in IE social media channels. So let us now, let us start the webinar and let me introduce our guest speaker. Our speaker for today is Feliz Prudente Santa Maria, an awarded cultural worker and author for five decades. She pioneered study of the country's colonial food history by using predominantly written sources stretching back into the Renaissance age of exploration and forward to early years of the Philippine Republic restored in 1946. She is known for a storytelling style through her Philippine Food History 101 Instagram posts at Feliz P. Santa Maria. Filipino Food History website, FelizPSantaMaria.net and popular books. Academic papers published in history and culture journals are providing a baseline for successor generations to discover the power of food in civics education, as well as social, economic, and political development. So without further ado, I give the floor to our speaker. Okay, wait. <laughs> Hi! Hello, everybody. I know I have some friends out there, so thank you for taking the time to join us. And uh, it's nice to be with the Intramuros Administration Network. It's our first time. And I'm worried about the time. So maybe, Christian, maybe you can start with the first part. How's that? Okay. And then you can ask me questions after it's done, before we go into the second, second part. Welcome to Feeding Manila, with its focus on foreign culinary influences during the colonial era from 1571 to 1945. Part one narrates little known food challenges during the early years of Manila's founding as Spain's capital in the Far East, and even lesser known culinary adaptations made by the Spanish in their new tropical environs. After part one, we will take a short question and break and then move into part two that looks into the foods of Manila's cuisine and their links to pre-colonial traditions. It is worth recalling that no one forced Filipinos to like certain foods and beverages. During the Spanish colonial times, the only rules enforced were those of the Roman Catholic Church for fasting, abstinence, and feasting. Disobedience was punished, by the way. In American times, dietary changes based on nutrition were promoted but only recommendatory. Just like today, Manilans from all strata, just like all Filipinos, 
have been choosing what foods they prefer since colonial times. Manila cuisine is a capital city cuisine. The seat of archipelago-wide government and the center of business and communications have been in Manila since 1571. Manila food, beverage, and dining customs created an identity for Spain's Filipinas, as they would later for America's Philippine Islands, and as they do now for the Philippines, an independent republic. Within its diversity of dishes, Manila's capital cuisine has come to represent colonial food identity at its peak of innovation and creativity. The foods are no longer Chinese or Japanese or Spanish or American, but Filipino. The capital maintains access to international influence through ingredients, technology, literature, culinary education, food products, food services, and even culinary fashions. It maintains access to archipelago-wide ingredients and influences, and it likewise influences archipelago-wide cuisine. Like all cuisines, Manila cuisine is inherently dynamic, meaning it is susceptible to transition and change. In terms of Spanish colonial influences, Manila was where Spanish culture was kept alive as best as could be done in pageantry, clothing, and food. Our talk is only an introduction to major developments in Manila cuisine during colonial times from 1571 to 1946. To understand the complex culinary growth that occurred and still occurs, one can go to At Feliz Peace Stamaria and begin by reading from the earliest, the very first IG post, moving towards the most recent ones. There are over 1,400 vignettes arranged along a chronological spine. When put together, they are like a college subject Filipino Food History 101 that, by the way, is not offered by any school. Let us begin our survey of Spanish colonial culinary influences by emphasizing that food security was a fundamental challenge when Manila started out as a colonial capital. During pioneering times, Filipinas was a hardship post and a hostile one. Six colonials to increase the carrying capacity of Manila and its environs to provide food in sync with its population. We generally overlook that colonials had to maximize what they found, meaning the pre-colonial and local in Manila's food supply chain. There can be no sharing of different cuisines unless there is strong interaction between them. Interaction between Spaniards and natives was very limited at first. Starting in 1580, only missionaries were allowed to live amongst natives during the conquista. Not till around 170 years later, not till the 1750s, did missionaries report that they were servicing one million natives, indicating that perhaps the conquista could be declared over. Now, we all know that peace supports the steadiness of food availability. When the conquista ended, lay Spaniards could live away from Intramuros and interact with natives, and Spaniards could live outside the walls. How did the colonials adjust to a tropical environment when they were used to a temperate one? Did the colonials eat Filipino food? Allow me to share what I've found so far. In the 1570s until the early 1600s, Manila was transitioning from a city with buildings made of bamboo and wood to one of stone, mirroring a fortified Spanish city. Only Spaniards and their domestics, who included Indios, were allowed to reside in Manila. Native and Chinese daytime workers had to leave before drawbridges were raised and locked to protect the city at night. The government maintained a royal warehouse inside Manila, close to Fort Santiago. 
The first strategy for food security was to import essentials from abroad. From Spain, China, and Japan came wheat needed to make sea biscuit a standard ration for soldiers and sailors and also for galleon voyages. The finest and whitest flour was needed for host. From Spain came grape wine for food rations, home use, and especially for mass. Almost immediately, China with its temperate climate became Manila's most proximate and principal foreign food supplier. It was the source for sugar, sweets, candied sugar, licorice, barley, nuts, oranges, pears, raisins, cooking lard, food plants, and seeds. As the Manila galleon business needed more and more preserved rations, because its ships got bigger, salt was imported from China. Then, Chinese workers were contracted to start salt evaporation farms along the Paranaque and Cavite shorelines near the galleon headquarters. Colonialization increased the population and required provisions for the galleon trade. The food situation was dire. The second strategy was to collect annual tribute payable in food, especially rice. In 1604, the tribute per male indio was 10 reales. The rice equivalent varied from 137.5 to 187.5 gantas depending on where it was farmed. Farmers with well-watered fields had to give more grain than those cultivating poor terrain. Tribute was seen as a means to intensify food self-sufficiency. Much later on, one could pay the tribute in currency instead of food and textile. A third strategy during the pioneering period was to demand food quotas from nearby provinces. In 1598, Manila survived because the following provisions shown on the screen were delivered weekly. Neighboring provinces took turns supplying the demand, and one can imagine the strain it put on natives. The fourth strategy was to raise Spanish food supplies in Filipinas. Spaniards like beef, but there were no cows in Filipinas. In 1589, 20 cows and two bulls were sent to Manila to start a breeding program for ranching as ordered by King Philip II. Cows were part of the Spanish identity and introducing them to the colonies was fundamental to bringing Spanish culture. Wheat was tested in different areas and there were times when there was enough wheat grown to make some sea biscuit, but there was little terrain suitable to wheat and import continued. Grapes and melons grew in fortified Cavite's naval headquarters, and Chinese immigrants around Manila were farming asparagus, cabbage, carrots, celery, endive, lettuce, parsley, radish, and other temperate weather ingredients. The colonial government acknowledged that Filipinas was an uncultivated wilderness. Spaniards did not want to farm. They wanted to get rich from the galleon trade. Farming fell to native Filipinos and imported Chinese workers. A fifth security strategy was for them to grow new world ingredients in Filipinas. With Acapulco and Manila on similar latitudes, it was thought some Mexican flora and fauna could indigenize in Filipinas. Among the many are those shown on the screen. There was also a manila duck raised and exported from Filipinas to Mauritius and Reunion Islands, where it was called manila duck. It may have been the Moscovy duck that was fatter and more strongly flavored than common ducks. The sixth strategy was to introduce production techniques, agricultural and culinary equipment, as well as foods from around the world. Some examples are coffee from the Near East, big mangoes from India, balimbing from Ternate that was sweeter than what was growing locally, salt evaporation farming from China, water buffalo and the wet field plow from China, sugar mills and evaporation pans from the New World. The colonial government built a central market for Manilans. Food had to be sold only there to control prices. Food costs always threatened to skyrocket. 
1581, the first bishop, Domingo Salazar, suggested the Chinese be given their own place and missionaries. The Chinatown was called Parian. Migrants were restricted to live, trade, work, and sell food only in the Parian. Fire, earthquake, overpopulation, and security breaches caused new Chinese enclaves to be built one after the other. By 1628, Chinese who converted to Christianity were allowed to marry natives and live outside the Parian. Mestizo de Sangle became a tax category in 1741 because there were so many of the mixed breed. Chinese and native cuisines were mixing at the grassroots. Missionaries working in provinces and hinterlands help Manilans adjust to insular cuisines. Spaniards were able to find island substitutes for the temperate clime ingredients that would not grow. It created a Phil Hispanic cuisine. Casubha and turmeric were substitutes for saffron. There was banana heart for artichoke, paho mango or wild duhat for olive fruit needed for brining, pagatpat from China for fig, Sungai for vanilla, toyo instead of cod, lard instead of olive oil for cooking. Rice flour and buri flour were used instead of wheat flour. Dayap for lemon, pili for almond, carabao milk for cow milk, palm and grape wine mixed together instead of pure grape wine. Colonizers and the colonized shared several cooking techniques in 1571 when Manila was founded, roasting and cooking with liquid in a vessel. Native Spanish dishes cooked those ways could slip one into the other. Some native foods were recorded in writing as being eaten by the Spanish colonials, sometimes with their alterations. For instance, you see on the screen dried native fish with beans preserved in oil eaten during Lent. There was an unnamed stew of pig's trotters. Bird's nest soup, sinigang, tinola, wild venison roasted or as tapang usa, paho and green mango preserved in vinegar, green mango juice as a marinade, fresh native cheese, native sugar cubes with water, balimbing dried or in syrup, santol sweet conserve, mangosteen as jam and prepared with gulaman. By the end of the 1700s, nearby sources for feeding Manila had stabilized. For instance, there was Pasay where rice, oranges, sugar cane, sweet potato, tomato, kidney beans, and betel chew grew. Rice in Tunasan, wheat in Batangas from Tanawan to Lipa. Tondo province provided rice, chicken, duck, turkey, carabao milk, cabbage, lettuce, turnip, radish. Pasig along the main river raised duck and bulut liked by Chinese mestizos as well as rice. The number of Spaniards in Manila and the rest of the colony was fewer than most of us might expect. As the 1800s began, the Spaniards of Manila and its suburbs did not number more than 1,000 families, including people of mixed blood who passed themselves off as Spaniards. An increase in peninsular Spaniards for government and military positions was sent after the galleon trade ended in 1815 because Mexico had declared its independence. More peninsular Spaniards arrived after the 1872 Cavite mutiny and the Philippine Revolution of 1896 to 1898. Europeans and other foreigners arrived in small numbers when the colony shifted to free trade starting in 1835. When Suez Canal opened in 1869 and steamships were sailing, Manila cuisine experienced an era of innovation that continued through World War II. Welcome to Feeding Manila. Thank you, ma'am.
Okay, to our attendees, that is, that is the end of the first par, part of the of our session for today. So you may now send your questions via Q&A button or the comment section of our Facebook Live. So we have a question here. So th this question is not necessarily about Manila food, but about Filipino food in general and on how it is constantly being reinvented. So, pastil in Mindanao is made from rice topped with chicken or fish. However, some outside Mindanao have started to use pork in pastil. There was recently a viral post in social I'm media regard regarding this. Uh, this is being a cultural uh, appropriation. So, what is your take on this, ma'am? I think that uh, we have to all be very careful. And we have to remember where a... Uh, where a dish began. And if you're going to carry the name of that dish and it comes from an area where pork is taboo, it is very wrong to put in pork. I remember a similar incident. Uh, well, it's a little different, but there was a group of, of uh, well-meaning, very well-meaning cooks, I think here in Manila, and they gave themselves a name that made them sound like they were uh, Muslim, but then they weren't. And um, I, I kept saying, you know, maybe you should change your name because when people see that, they expect your food to be halal. They, you know, you might have a varied menu. You could even have a European menu and not a Filipino menu, but it, it, it would have to be halal. And, and it, it isn't at all, no? It was just because some um, Mindanao foods were part of the menu. So I think all of us, we're in the, almost in the middle of the 21st century. By now, it should be clear to all Filipinos that there has to be this multicultural respect. So that's my answer to that. You know, I, um, before we, we move into the second part, uh, I, I hope you'll understand that the Philippines, in a way, was very lucky that it was so far from Spain because there were so few Spaniards here. And then there were so few pan Spaniards who were mixing, really mixing with the Filipinos. And in a way, that protected our local cuisines. Our local cuisines were able to dominate whatever foreign cuisines were introduced. So we would cook foreign cuisines our way. The other very important thing to remember, um, and I think uh, Leroy, in the you know just as the colonial period was shifting from the Spanish to the American, he explained. He said, you know, there's so many Chinese mestizos, but don't be misled when a Chinese married an Indio or a Filipino, the children were raised according to the Filipino manner, and. It was, they really considered themselves Filipino. The only reason they needed that Mestizo Sangle title was for tax purposes. A Mestizo Sangle paid more, more tax than an Indio. You see, so, so in many ways, the fact that there wasn't this mixing, the fact that the Chinese did not push their Chinese identity on their children once they became um, they be, once they married a native woman has helped our cuisine. So I don't know, maybe, maybe let's, uh, okay, now just, just to bear in mind, and I have to read this or I'm going to make a mistake. So around 1838, just after the galleon trade was over and then the Philippines was open for free trade by 1834 and in 1835, the ports were open. Look at this, there were only 1,500 European Spaniards, peninsulares, and there were 3,500 insulares, local Spaniards. So we, they, the local Spaniards were outnumbering, really outnumbering the peninsulares. That's 5,000 Spaniards in the whole country. And then the Chinese mestizos were, I'm sorry, Spanish mestizos were only 20,000, Chinese Filipino mestizos were 240,000 all over the country. And by that time, the Chinese were down to 10,000. 
Okay, so th th this is the kind of population we, we need to take this into consideration when we say, oh, how did our food become like that? Where was the mixing? And now I think the second part, right? Christian talks a little bit about the mixing. So you can play the second part and I'm sure there'll be questions after that. So we can move into part two. I shall, uh, I shall play ma'am na yung second part or shall we answer these questions oh, in Q&A? Wala ako nakikita. Ano pang three meron? questions po dito oh, sa Q&A. Okay oh, po. Ah. <laughs> with a strong colonial influence uh, from Sur Domingo, with a strong colonial influence in the Philippines and how various techniques affected original Filipino tradition, how can the nation strive in the culinary field while maintaining the Filipino identity of the dish? Considering that consumers most of the time want something new, special, and exquisite. Well, first of all, that is the Filipino. I have an I did a lecture for NCCA several years ago, and some of the uh and, and some of some of the findings, these are conclusions after years and years and years of studying. Um one of them is that Filipinos get bored easily with their food. That is why. We have to have a lot of salsawans. We have to have a lot of different uh, kinds of dishes on our plate, okay? And we will never be left behind in fashion. Food fashion, we really want to try everything. We're very curious people. So what is important is that the people, one, that the people who are really promoting Filipino food always try to keep what is the most important, um, uh, the most important part of a Filipino dish, whether it has a Spanish name, a Chinese name, a Filipino name, but it's part of Filipino food. Uh, don't move too far away. In other words, keep keep. If it's supposed to be sinigang and it's supposed to be sourish, okay, meaning from mildly sour to slightly more sour, because in the Visayas it's very light sour. And then like in Cavite, it's very sour. Tagalog is very sour. Don't, don't deviate from that and don't turn it into tom yum. Don't put in the green ingredients like the chili because it's not there, the red chili. That's, it's not there. So you have to stick to it. So it becomes our responsibility. And our food, trust me, is good the way it is. It's good the way it is. You have to have faith in who we are and in our food. What's next? I hope that answers it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from DOT, D. Mandigma. Is kilaw a Filipino way of cooking during colonial times or it is our adaptation of Spanish, Spanish ceviche? Okay, very easy to answer. Um, ceviche, if you look up the history, is supposed to be a, a Peruvian adaptation, the word from uh, escabeche. Okay, which means that ceviche very likely did not, did not become a dish, I guess, until after the colonial presence. If there were something like it with a Peruvian, uh, a pre, a pre-colonial name that hasn't yet come up, okay? So um, going by that, ceviche is, Introduce ceviche is based on a colonial word. Whereas our kilau, uh, and we'll get back to that later, the kilau, uh, we have that document that the earliest is um, 1609 for, yeah, 1609 is our earliest for kilau in Tagalog. But if you go to the National Museum, they, they still have the records of having found um, fish bones and these, these two, uh, they disintegrated, unfortunately, but these two halves of uh, tabon tabon fruit. And it's, it could be that they use the, the tabon tabon, they squeeze the juice, right? And that was what they used to uh, flavor, actually flavor and help change the chemistry of the fish. And that is how they make kilau up to now in that area. And to what date is the archeological find? 13th century. So very, very, very pre-colonial. 1200s. 1200s. Could be Arkilao. 
and kilaw. Okay, this is where sometimes we get a little mixed up. You know, uh, kilaw isn't really cooking, right? Um, in fact, I don't know in your families, but in my family, okay, kilaw in my family on the Cavite side is you want the fish or the shrimp fresh, which is why the best kilaw I've had is in the fish pond in a banca. Okay. And the second was when I was out a little further on and they were catching fish and cleaning it right on the boat. How do you make kilaw? Then we had vinegar. Okay. So you just have this communal little bowl of vinegar. They give you your, um, your, your bit of fish. And all you do is you dip it and then you take it out and you eat it. It's like sashimi. It's, it's raw and it's only sandalit, no? In the same way with the shrimp, you, you peel it and then you dip it and you eat it right away. You do not submerge the fish or the shrimp and leave it there to turn white. You just dip it like sashimi and eat it. So that's the kilau that, that we grew up with. I know that there are others now who leave the, leave the protein in the acid a little longer. But Kilau is like you take it hilau, you dip it, and then it becomes kilau. No? So it's not really quote cooking it. It's more like passing it quickly through the acid that will not only flavor it, but that will make it easier to digest. The chemistry changes just enough so it's easy to digest. So our kilau seems to be older. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So, a lot older. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. There's this one question. So, go for transition na lang natin to the second part. Yeah. Um, Mom, Mikaela, Carissa, Makapas, and an anonymous attendee. Halos magkamuha lang po yung question. Oh, sige nga so, is, is, po. Is, is there a Filipino food that is we can call purely indigenous? Without foreign influence, though? Po? Uh, medyo mahirap yan. Sagutin. No, kilaw is one in the sense that it's uh, we can use any any uh, native uh, souring agent. It doesn't even have to be vinegar, and then whatever is there in the you know that in a way that I think could be could be yeah that could be. Although I I hope you understand that there are other countries and cultures that also have, they eat raw fish, which is kilau, it's raw fish, right? So they also have a culture of eating raw fish and raw meat, like raw deer meat that you just, again, pass through an acid. So yes, it's, yes it is ours, the ingredients are ours, but it's a part of human, I guess, Human development, culinary development. First, you eat it raw. Then you eat it raw, but with a, a little dip or something, you know. And then you cook. It's part. It's part of. It's part of a development process. Like dinuguan, so many countries cook with blood, or even drink the blood as food, fresh. You see. So you take a take a macro view and be glad that we're part of this whole, you know, this this whole growth of the world. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, uh, I shall now play the second part. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> We begin part two of Feeding Manila by emphasizing that Manila cuisine is the product of coexisting food traditions that mingle and become innovations. And some of those innovations can evolve into new traditions. Some Spanish influences on Manila cuisine include the 12 listed on the screen. Stewing, sometimes referred to as guisado. Frying as the first step to stewing the pre-cooking marinade or pambabad, which is 
the adobo in Spanish. Force meats, what we call rellenos. Five, cooked sauces or salsas or sarsas. Six, oven baking, including use of the Banyo Maria. Seven, slow cooking over low fire or in low heat. And then there's two fire stove top cooking, sometimes called dos juegos. Then making conserves, sherbets. The introduction of French and continental culinary fashions. Beer brewing and Ginebra distilling. Chinese influences began in the Spanish era and continued into Manila's American colonial era. Some of the influences include quick stir frying over very, very high heat, steaming, slow cooking over low fire, such as the Tim's, and making Chinese ham. The influences on the left column were added to what existed in both Filipino and Spanish cooking when Manila was founded in 1571. By 1898, the influences on the left column were in place and ready for the addition of new colonial influences. North American influences on Manila food include these seven among others. So we begin with cooking with canned goods. And then the spread of bakeries and home baking. Three, commercial and homemade sherbets and ice creams. Four, increase interest in conserved meats, fruits, and vegetables made locally at home, as well as at factories, local factories. And then we have cocktails and punches. And number six, recipes in home economics and adult education textbooks newspapers, grocery handouts, advertising booklets, and even in radio programs. All of these recipes increasing interest in culinary experimenting and home cooking. And lastly, modern equipment for home cooking and factories that were making food products. So clearly, Manila colonial cuisine was never static. From 1838 to 1846, the visiting physician Jean Malau recorded what Manila colonials were eating. They're up on the screen, the, di the menu. Breakfast upon waking up, you can see chocolate beverage with or without the milk, biscuits, bread, and butter. Then you have a breakfast later on, sometimes in the family's communal bathhouse out on Pasig River. So you would have the rice and the frittada and the ham and the vigler and jams and cooked fish and fresh pineapple and mango if they were in season. Lunch or what they would call the comida principal could be anywhere from about 11.30 or 12 all the way until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And they would include this mysterious sopas ng mestiza. And of course, white rice, sinigang, dried fish, frittada, dila ng baka, ox tongue, in other words, albondigas, curry, Chinese ham, venison tapa, quail, turkey, capon, pajo or green mango pickles, jams, which were also called haleas, dulces or conservas, and fresh food, fruits. After the Angelus was prayed, there was a snack, chocolate beverage or tea in some cases, and biscuits. Dinner was very late. In most cases, it was after the gate closed at 11 p.m. So it could be a heavy meal with rice and tinola made with pumpkin and chicken, or something very light, such as a glass of lemonade or water, just a glass of water, in which one dipped a piece of azucarillo uh, az, that was also called caramelo. If any of us here stopped by for a visit, our host would offer us immediately a glass of sugared water or a glass of water and a spoonful of fruit conserve, as well as betel nut chew and cigars. Also mentioned as part of the Manila diet of colonials was fresh milk, warm milk, meaning that the milk was cooked at home before drinking it or adding it to chocolate, and fresh native cheese. There would be an increase in the variety of Manila's foods after 1869 when Suez Canal opened and shortened the Europe-Asia sailing route, and when steamships offered quicker travel time for both products and people. 
Just as a reminder, the typical native Filipino diet in the Manila area consisted of rice cooked without seasoning, fresh fish or dried fish, vegetables cooked in water or coconut milk, raw vegetables steeped in vinegar, tapa, roasted meats, uh, accompanying dips that included local and Spanish vinegar, soy sauce, even bagoong, green mango pickles, fresh ripe fruit, all of those were the accompaniments. There was tuba, and there was also water, and there was chocolate. Those were the three common beverages of Manila's Filipinos. Now we get to Sinigang. We will start to share a few historical notes about Manila cuisine influenced by foreign presence, starting with Sinigang. Sinigang is found in Tagalog vocabularies of the 1600s, but not in those for Visayan languages. The earliest written description we have found so far is from 1609. Sinigang is fish cooked in vinegar and water and salt. In 1613, in Tagalog, nagsisigang also referred to cooking meat. It's very likely that the first tomatoes that reached Filipinas from Mexico were only half a thumb in diameter and very sour. They easily became a sinigang ingredient, especially because they grew wild and were free for the picking. Sinigang was eaten by both Filipinos and Spaniards, especially the Spanish women who had been born and raised in Manila because they had Filipino yayas and domestic helpers. To them, sinigang was comfort food. Tinola is the result of tola, meaning cooking with a liquid, and it appears in a 1628 Visayan vocabulary for a fish dish with broth. Tinola may have even been what Pigafetta ate in 1521. The word is not yet in Tagalog vocabularies of the early 1700s, but we know that by the 1800s, tinola was part of Manila cooking. The recipe shown is from 1938. It uses pre-colonial ginger, shallot, garlic, and upo, plus New World potato, papaya, and chili leaves. Like sinigang, tinola is likely a pre-colonial food that kept its place on the tables of both Filipinos and Spaniards. Recall that tinola was the first course in the dinner that opens Noli Mitangere. Ibarra the hero left before the second course could be served. If you want to know more about foods and the urbanizing etiquette of Manila, read the Tagalog book Urbana at Felisa, published in several editions from 1846 until the early 1900s. Philippine adobo is unique among all adobos of the Spanish Empire. Spanish marinade, which is what adobo means, became the name of a cooked dish in the Philippines. Philippine adobo is made by marinating, as a first step, the Spanish way, marinate and then cook, and a second way, by bypassing the marinade and cooking the protein in vinegar directly, just like pre-colonial paksu, which is similar to Spanish escabeche. Adobo was a food that could last, especially if packed in thick lard, and it became a provision for sailors doing a Philippine-Indonesia or Philippine-Malaysia route. Missionaries born and educated in Spain had a layover in Mexico until their galleon arrived there they learned about common Mexican foods and they wondered if any of them existed in Manila. Tamal was a common portable Mexican food. We suspect its portability was important to missionaries who had to walk and sail very long distances. In 1613, the native Tagalog suman was likened to the tamal. In 1521, there already was a record of a Visayan rice cake cooked while wrapped in leaves, but Picofete did not give its name. So again, we have suman as a very likely pre-colonial food 
that remained active in Manila's colonial era diet. We need to recognize that Mexican influence on Philippine cuisine is more by the way of the introduction of new flora and fauna and not from Mexican dishes embedding themselves in Philippine cuisine. Many signature ingredients for Mexican food like nopal cactus, for instance, could not grow in the Philippines. Mole has so many variations in Mexico. We hardly find it in the Philippines. By 1847, the mole served in a Manila calenderia was described only as a stew of beef or pork with anato. In 1918, a recipe for pollo con salsa de chocolate is made with some sugar, potato, onion, tomato, vinegar, and salt, and it reminds of one version of mole. A Manila chicken dish that disappeared has a recipe from 1932, which puts it right into the colonial era. A contemporary version might be a good addition to Manila's current heritage foods. Pollo a la bilondeña was cooked with garlic, onion, nutmeg, vinegar, and it was served with a sauce of fried and ground peanut, garlic, and beaten egg yolk. The Parian fed colonials since the late 1500s. By mid-1800s, there is record of there having been noodle makers, panciteros, and restaurant owners in the Parian. By the next century, panciterias were part of Manila's foodscape, and they were restaurants. Panciterias in the U.S. era spread into Intramuros and all the way to, to Ermita and Malate. So pancit is street food that anchored Manila's Chinese restaurants. Pancit is a Filipino word based on a Hokkien word for fast cooking. Only in the Philippines does pancit mean noodles. The word is unique and it started in colonial Manila. Pancit was affordable, convenient to eat. It allowed many varieties to be made and it was accessible to customers we must remember that one finds a global pattern that when a food has traditionalized, it is when there are many, many variations of it within an area. Tinapay was recorded in 1521 as a kind of rice cake in Cebu, but it wasn't described. The use of tinapay to mean wheat bread in stories about Jesus Christ changed its meaning wherever there were missionaries to tell that story and associate the word tinapay with wheat bread. In 1847, only Spaniards and other foreigners in Manila were eating wheat bread as part of their meal. But by Rizal's boyhood in the 1860s, natives were eating bread, yet rice remained their main staple. Bread increased as a snack during U.S. colonial times. The bottommost left image is of the first royal or government-approved bakery. It was inside Intramuros. Spanish bakers preferred to trade, so Chinese were hired to do the baking with a Spaniard as overseer. In 1848, a royal order allowed duty-free import of ice into Manila. Americans encouraged the building of ice plants around the Philippines, and once ice factories were established, cold and iced foods were added to the diet. Sorbetes is from sherbet, fruit syrup, <coughs> that flavored finely crushed ice. Ice cream is cream or milk turned into ice and then beaten till fine and light with a sweetener or a flavorer. Having an ice box and better yet a refrigerator was the aspiration of families wanting to be modern. They could serve frozen dishes made at home. Fruits conserved in syrup were served with the syrup or drained of it. They brightened the appetite and were used during holy days and holidays. They were so important to the Spanish diet, even in 1521 during the Magellan-Elcano voyage. 
and during the Paseo del Pendón, the Alfarez Real of Manila sent dishes of sweets to the Governor General, the Archbishop, and other leaders according to various ceremonial protocol. Fruit conserves or dulces were the common postre for Spanish in Manila. In U.S. times, fruit conserves were encouraged as a means to stop wasting fruits and as a small home business. Maria Orosa made the first recipes for them using food science. Her experiments were exhibited at the Manila Carnival starting in 1925. Preserved fruits became ingredients for Filipino fruitcake and halo halo. Free trade between the U.S. and the Philippine Islands spurred the use of canned goods as emergency supplies, relief from food boredom, as handy and constant cooking ingredients, and as convenience foods. There was a battle for brand loyalty. Sun-made raisins began to figure in everything from rellenos to pickles. Royal baking powder and its rival, the Calumet brand, promoted home baking. National Foods pioneered Filipino canning of Philippine adobo, apritada, mango cheeks in syrup, and milkfish. The 1922 Home Economics textbook for all girls in public schools had a recipe for bibinka that had reached Manila no later than the 1700s and the newly introduced American birthday cake. The 1932 Sans Rival recipe from Pasita Mascognana's private cooking classes at Centro Escolar was precious. Originally of imported almond, Filipinos translated the recipe using locally grown cashew. Manila's homemakers could bake and be saluted for their efforts. Let us end this sampling of colonial Manila's cuisine by sharing three wedding menus. Then as now, wedding food is an indicator of aspirational and status cuisine. So take time to look at them. In 1907, Restaurant de France catered Paella Verinciana and Benguet Coffee. By 1919, Tom's Dixie Kitchen was catering a Norte Americano menu. By comparison, the rightmost menu of 1912 was a provincial wedding menu heavily influenced by Spanish cooking that included leche flan and candied fruit. Manila's cuisine is anchored on anonymous cooks who worked for Spanish colonials, Chinese overseas workers, foreign travelers and traders, American colonials, and Filipinos who included mestizos. The cooks were Filipino or Chinese, once in a while, a foreign import. Recipe books were sold and later printed in Manila. The capital had the widest array of imported and local ingredients. Manila colonial cuisine embraced street food, restaurant and caterer fare, and fine dining fit for visiting royalty. Food providers for the well-off inspired lower-priced interpretations of the dishes for a wider market. In conclusion, Manila colonial era cuisine with its foreign and native influences would create food fashions and establish an identity for Filipino cuisine. Ay, wait lang po, ma'am. Hindi ko na-flash yung two slides sa dulo. Ah, yes. We have something to share with you. Because um, sometimes people ask for suggested readings, di ba? That's what Christian means. So for suggested meetings, we have, um, we have a, uh, an, an image. And I was talking to Filipinas Heritage Library, which is inside the Ayala Museum building. And they have online uh, services. They have they have those books, and they have some of the other books I've written that are not on the screen. So the Boxer Codex, which was recently, well, sort of recently published, republished with an English translation, is something worth reading. 
And then Governor General's Kitchen, which is out of print. It has an extensive bibliography that you can, you know, you can try to read the references in the biblio. So I know Filipinas Heritage Library has a copy. And the latter one, uh, Jean Mala, it has recently been reprinted by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. I think by now we all know that their books are very nicely priced. You know, you don't have to really save up for months and months to be able to buy a copy. And Jean Mala, um, is the one who explains uh, that the Spanish colonials, the ones who had been born and bred here, they were not in, in their homes, they were Filipino. In the way they, they the way they dressed was with the lighter clothing. They ate Filipino food. The women, the women liked to eat with their fingers. They knew how to make the little rice ball and make subo. And it was only when they had to go out in public that they would start wearing whatever was the European fashion. So Mala is a very nice, insightful book to read. I, I highly recommend it. So visit the National Historical Commission for that or ask Filipinas Heritage Library if they can somehow find an online copy maybe for you or visit their library. And then what do we have after that? Ah. My, my, my favorite quotation, okay. But take a look at that. On the left side, that's the cover of what seems to be the first Philippine, quote, Manila published cookbook, La Cocina Filipina. It's full of colonial Manila food. And it mentions that if you are applying to be a cook in a gentry household or a Mestizo household or a Spanish household, you had to know how to cook something called red chicken. Okay, so again, recipes for things like that are in La Cocina Filipina. The only copy here is at um, Ateneo Library in the American Historical Collection. And then look at that Santa Ana Cabaret, you see the spaghetti? That's when spaghetti started to be popular here with the sauce already mixed in, the, the American style. Uh, before that, we had macaroni through the Spanish cooking, but not spaghetti. And on the right, notice, there was a Filipino invention to try to make a locally made um, fogon stove with an oven just like the expensive imported ones. So again, Filipinos not gonna be left out. They'll try and make something local. Uh, they'll adopt to the situation. So anyway, there, how are our questions doing? I, I hope that there are questions. Yeah, um, there is this question. How do we legally protect the ge geographical context of our food and produce. In Europe, they have this concept called terroir, which is pro uh, protected by geographical indications legislation. Do you think this is something we can also do in the Philippines? If we do our research well, remember that number one, you have got to start researching even if the material is not in English. You have to force yourself okay, to protect Imagine we have to learn the languages of the colonials in order to protect our Filipino history and identity. So we have to learn those languages, okay? Uh, so we have to do a lot of research. And uh, I, I mean, I, I have books here on, on, on uh, international certification of food and how you do it. But the ingredients, for our dish have got to be consistent and from a specific place. Um, I was just watching television last night uh, for whatever this is worth, Kentucky, you know, like Colonel Sanders, what is it, KFC? It turns out it was really originally Kentucky Fried Chicken, but they could not use Kentucky anymore 
in the modern branding because Kentucky state government had acquired Kentucky as a brand. If you used the word Kentucky, you would have to pay the government of Kentucky a certain price to put the word there. And of course, they would also be very careful about the quality because they were very proud of it being from Kentucky. It's, uh, it's like champagne. That's why now you have champagne can only come from the champagne area of France. And everything else is considered another, another product, you know, sparkling, but not a champagne. But this mindset, think about it here. Uh, if, we were to, if we were to start thinking of saying this particular product, let's say this is a Davao something, okay? Uh, can the other areas growing the same fruit, for instance, accept that and understand why Davao is branding that thing as Davao's? which means that uh, if it's grown in Tanawan, Tanawan cannot then call it the Davao fruit. You know, so, and yet they're growing it. So what does it become, the Tanawan fruit? The Tanawan variety? But the seed is the Davao version. So it's, it, it's, it's a mindset. And this is going to take a lot of culinary education. And I, I sincerely hope that with webinars like this, our young generation of foodies who are going to be the leaders in all of this, thank you, keep looking into it and try to understand the basis for it. We can't just jump in. That's another thing. Sometimes we say, "Oh, let's get let's 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 get a Philippine a Philippine thing uh, on that international list." You have to understand the process, how others got those things of theirs on the list. And again, there's a lot of research that goes on into making a dossier, a dossier for any of these nominations. It's not that easy. So uh, yes, I hope at some time we can. It's gonna need a lot of research and a lot of discipline in the making of whatever we are trying to register. Remember that the Philippines is, has many, um, many similarities in food to its ASEAN neighbors because we have the same uh, ingredients and our ingredients kept crisscrossing from our different countries. So again, a lot of research. Yes, I think in the future, when you become my age, yes, I think by then we will have something. Yes. Um, I would start also looking into things like the Philipp you know, like Filipino adobos, at least just giving it a name first, not even registering it. Filipino adobo, for instance, is not somebody else's adobo. It's our kind in all its variations. And remember, I always say this, once something goes into the world, it becomes the world's favorite. It is never going to be the same as when you gave it to the world. Think of pizza. Pizza's global. There's American pizza, Filipino pizza, spaghetti. Spaghetti is how many international variations on spaghetti? It's a Japanese spaghetti. It doesn't taste like any of the Italian spaghettis. So um, I don't know if Japan will ever say, this is Japanese spaghetti. Don't anybody ever try to take it away from us? You know? Um, let's see. Let's see. Thank you, ma'am. We have a question here from Almira Diaz. What can we say when someone, a friend or a random stranger, tells us that we don't really have a unique food that can be called ours or Filipino because we've been influenced by other cultures a lot? 
wherever that person is from, his or her food will have been influenced by so many other cultures. It's just that he or she doesn't know it. The transference of uh, botanicals, edible botanicals is so fascinating. The same thing with, um, I, I'm vegan, but anyway, uh, with animals, edible animals. They, they also have been crisscrossing like that Manila duck. So you need to explain first that the Philippine cuisine, like every global cuisine is a mix, it's a blend. Even Italian food, it's a blend from different regions. And where did the rice come from? The rice was first brought in from Spain. And where did Spain get the rice? The Moors brought the rice in. So, so it, it's, it's like that, you know? Um, there's a lot of mixing. And that should be our pride, the fact that we are proud of the fact that we have made something so innovative from all this mix of ingredients and technologies and flavors and tastes and passions. And we're very proud of our food. It brings us comfort. It's the food that we like to share to our closest friends. And they like, their food. They like our food because when we serve our food, it's not just the taste. We serve our food with joy. We serve our food really wanting them to have fun and enjoy the food and become our friends. That whole package, that's our food. It's not just what we're eating. Remember that. Our food, the secret ingredient is joy and we have a whole lecture on that. And it's all based on historical documents. I'm not making it up. We have found historical documents to prove what our um, our uh, academics in sociology, for instance, have found, or anthropology, we have found historical proof. The papers are there if you want to read them. <laughs> they, most of them have been published. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, another question from an anonymous attendee. In our country now, where in the young ones were brought up sadly in fast foods, silogs, hot dog, instant noodle, what is the best way to inculcate and propagate the appreciation of genuine Filipino foods and tradition? I got news for you. Those fast foods are Filipino foods too. Remember we were saying, we were saying that um, Filipino food has everything from street food to the foods that was served when the son of, um, when, when the prince, the son of Queen Victoria visited us or when King Norodom came. That whole range, that whole range is, is, is Filipino cuisine, see? And fast food and uh, street food and fast food are, are kindred. Fast food is kind of like a version of, of street food. Remember pancit? Pancit became popular because it was fast cooking, not slow cooking. It was our version. It became, pancit is one of our versions of fast food versus the slow cooking for, um, let's say even adobo takes a long time to cook if you want it really, really nice and tender, okay? Or a good ham, you know, a good Filipino ham. And that, that takes a long time to cook. So we have both. The question, uh, and um, the question I think is for, for you, for your generation, is going to be, how are we going to prioritize eating uh, buying, promoting one kind of Filipino food over another kind of Filipino food. And there are going to be a lot of changes because of health. You're going to realize that you don't want to spend all your money on, on medicine, on headache pills or digestion pills. And you don't want to have, you don't want to be sick when you get old. You want to keep traveling. You want to keep experiencing the world. So you're going to want to be fit. And the food you're going to start choosing from our Filipino food is going to be what's going to keep you fit. 
So again, eating lower on the food chain is going to be part of your considerations. Eating food that's not so greasy, which is why now they have the air fryer. You see, th there's going to be an, a, there's going to be a lot of, of changes in the food. Of course, there's still going to be lechon. The thing is that you can't have lechon every day. See, before um, party food, fiesta food, you couldn't have it every day. So in a way, it regulated the health. But now, and I, I'm guilty of this, I eat enzymata every day, and that's not healthy. Not good, especially at my age. So again, I have to regulate, you know, say, no, not every day, you know, have something else for, you know, have something else for breakfast, not, not enzymata every day. But again, this is going to depend on you, which of the Filipino foods and which of their variations are you going to patronize? And allow, let's allow that dish to continue forever and ever and ever through your, your lifetime as part of Filipino traditional food. But maybe, again, with a slight change, maybe not as much fat. Cooking it maybe in uh, a coconut, a coconut, oil-based, um, instead of using pork lard, which is what you really use for the best, you know, the old cooking, but maybe using, you know, some of our current deodorized coconut edible oils, for instance. So you're going to be the ones to choose what you're going to want to keep and how you're going to alter it. That air fryer is marvelous. Cook a lot of Filipino food on that air fryer. You know, pressure cooker. Oh, a lot are also pressure cooking. So this is what I mean. That's really our food. But I would, I would hope that we will keep tinola, sinigang, suman, Filipino adobo, okay? Filipino ensaymada, which is not at all like the Mallorcan ensaymada. I mean, I'd like to hope that this is San Srival, Philippine San Srival, I, I, with the kasui. I'd like to think that these foods are always going to be part of us. Pansit. Don't let anybody else use that word pansit. You tell them, no, that's a Filipino word. You can't use pansit. You call your noodle something else. You know? Uh, but but that's it. That, that these things, it's up to you. Keep on eating pancit. In other words, you know, keep on eating tinola. If you don't, it's gonna disappear. Like that binondo chicken. I'm hoping that those of you in the tourism or who have restaurants in the binondo area or who are doing Manila cuisine, the recipe for binondo chicken is in the Governor General's kitchen. You can cook it, you can experiment, tweak it, tweak it for today's, for today's uh, preferences. But maybe resurrect the poor little bin on the chicken. That's Manila cuisine. Go through the recipes. I know you may, I, if you don't speak Spanish or you can't read Spanish, those recipes are so easy to translate. I don't know if the, what do you call it? The Google, the Google Translate. I don't know if it can trans, I've never tried to translate La Cocina Filipina recipes using that Google Translate, but it just might work. Then get a friend who speaks Spanish to help you out. And then see if some of those Manila recipes can be revived. We'll be the only ones in the world probably cooking old-fashioned Spanish food that has disappeared from Spain. Imagine that. That it was Manila cuisine. Mm, what other questions? Okay, thank you, ma'am. This one is still in connection with your answer about the spectrum of Filipi Filipino food. So this question is asked by Joseph Afundar, uh, former intern of IA. So... I <laughs> how, how did the rise of Sari Sari stores affect the development of Filipino cuisine? Ay, that's a whole lecture. 
that's a whole lecture. I think it's it's not only the sari sari store, but the idea of the convenience store, which up to now continues. I hope some of you are noticing patterns. You know what what we talked about is being repeated today. So um, sari sari and the tingi tingi. Uh, and the fact that Sari Sari stores can now sell food, cooked food. The Sari Sari store, Sari Sari store, especially in the 1920s. Um, if you look at the Manila, the Manila city rules, okay, there's a book. Um, I think that the one I looked at, I think is in the College of Law at UP. It's a 1927 maybe book. And it explains it lists down what a sari sari store should sell. And it is limited, you, you as a sari sari store owner are limited to selling only those things. And there are different classifications of sari sari stores, okay? And again, depending on your, your classification, you have more items that you can sell. So the sari sari stores uh, help spread the use of canned goods. Um, anything bottled. And uh, some Sari Sari stores into the 1960s, I remember I would go to the, you know, when I, when I was, uh, I was um, going to school, sometimes I would walk to the corner and there's a little Sari Sari store at the corner in San Juan. And it sold every morning freshly baked bread and I guess it was allowed, it was allowed to do that. It was, it did not bake bread on the premises, but it could sell it. And this was the interesting part. They were allowed to sell um, Libby's peanut butter. Okay. But instead of selling people uh, the smallest bottle, because people not everybody could afford, instead they would sell maybe um, the bread and the, the woman would bring up I saw this every day the woman would bring her little plate and then they would take two tablespoons of Libby's peanut butter and they put it on her plate and she would carry that along with her little uh, parcel of pandesal she would cross the street and then she would walk to wherever her house was that's a sari sari story because it's tingi tingi so it allowed you to have what you could afford Nowadays you have sachets, but uh, the, 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 the sachet is actually the thingy thingy. So it allowed certain products um, to be sold in small quantities that were affordable. You know? um, and now uh, convenience stores are like a sari sari store, but it's um, more, I guess it's a more 20th century, 21st century type of, of uh, place. And then they're even allowed to sell cooked food. So it crosses over into Karinderia. Karinderia now merges with uh, Sari Sari store and uh, grocerette and uh, that, that sort of thing, convenience food. And the word convenience is very important. You'll notice that the foods the foods that will last are also going to include those that are convenient. Even the cooking, there will be a, a convenience, a convenient to use ingredient. Before it was only tomato sauce. American colonial era introduced canned tomato sauce and the Filipino canning, one of the first things they started to can was tomato sauce. People liked it. That's why the bacalao or bacalao uh, recipes of the American period all used tomato sauce. Then later in the 50s, they added tomato paste. See, so it's the convenience. And now, for instance, anato, achuete. Thank heavens, Mamacita makes powdered achuete. I, I don't know if anybody else does, but hers is available. And that saves me a lot of trouble from having to pound it and grind it myself. You see, coffee. Coffee uh, was grown during the Spanish era, was introduced around the, the late, seven, mid, mid, late 1700s. And 
it took off when the Americans started to sell ground coffee in cans. Because you would have to roast your own coffee and then you would have this little grinder and you would have to grind it. And that just didn't seem convenient for a lot of people then. They weren't coffee connoisseurs like now. So you need something convenient to help boost the interest and maybe even the lasting lasting ability, the lasting the ability for a Filipino food to last prepared sauces. So I, I'm, I used to be a purist. I used to be a purist when it came to cooking Filipino food until I went to Thailand. And I took a short cooking class in Thai food. Boy, grinding, pounding. Oh my God. Okay. I had more appreciation for Thai food after that. And I think people who know how to cook Filipino food with also the same pounding and grinding and whatever, they will have more appreciation for Filipino food. But there, um, I bought these, they had just come out, ready-made sauces, you know, Thai sauces. So I brought them home here and I used them. And then one day I had this eureka moment and I said, my gosh, they're making, uh, they're making these wonderful versions of sauces here in the Philippines for, you know, I said, why don't I try them? And after trying them, I also use them, but I still also cook the old fashioned way without the pressure cooker, huh? And without the air fryer. But I also combine the convenience products. And I think that's, that's the way Filipino food is gonna go. If it's gonna stay, if those foods are gonna stay alive. So keep an open mind, and, and, but always remember you want it to, to stay alive and you want, you want people who will cook it the old way to be appreciated. The restaurants now that will cook Filipino food the old way, meaning long time stewing, you appreciate them, you spend more. You pay more because they use the best ingredients and they cook it longer. So again, you can't fight it. Think in terms of the value, the value. How much would you pay that person to make a long time stew for you? How much per hour is it gonna cost? The fuel, how much is it going to cost? Versus if I decided, okay, I'm going to get one of those ready-made, one of the ready-made, put it into my pot and cook it. It's good. But this costs me less than this one. And if I'm going to cook this one, I tell everybody I cook that the old way. You can taste it. I made, my heart went into it. Longer cooking it the old way than cooking it the fast way. So it's, it's up to us as consumers to decide what we value individually as a family and as a bigger community. What, what, what's another, any more questions, Lana? There's so another question 24, I don't know how much time you put aside for, for the program. Um, perhaps three last questions, ma'am? Okay. Can you? Okay. I, Mga bata ngayon, your, your attention span daw is short. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can speak for this generation. <laughs> okay. Um, here's a question. Um, hot is different from spicy. Hot refers to burning sensation, while spicy refers to the presence of spice. However, in Filipino language, both is referred to as maanghang, with no distinction between hot or spicy. Could this absence of vocabulary mean that uh, the Filipino palate is less sophisticated? Consequently, Filipino food compared to other Southeast Asian countries is strangely generally neither hot nor spicy. Apparently, Filipinos are not very fond of strong tasting food. Come to think about it, our food is very simple. Just salt, toyo, suka, and patis. Whereas in Southeast Asia, it's 
it's a charcuterie of flavors. What could be an explanation for this? Oh, you must read my paper. Ah, I, 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 I have something about that where it, it deconstructs the tastes. And uh, it shows which were our, our earliest anghang. Okay, the earliest Filipino anghang is made with the same ingredients as our Southeast Asian neighbors. Garlic, uh, shallot onion, not the, not the white sibuyas bombay, no? Or the red onion, but the shallot. And the gingers, the white ginger, the yellow ginger, and the langkawas that in Thailand they call blue ginger. Those were the first real anhang. I'm sure that there were others. Um, uh, there were others from these wild, these wild fruits and vegetables, uh, uh, these these wild berries and things. Because we we have names, but we don't have the we don't have the botanicals anymore. So that's the anhang to which the chili peppers were added. Um, it's true. I don't think from my findings up to a certain point, we, we were very happy with this nice, harmonious mingling of just enough piquancy. That's the anghang, no? Just enough piquancy to prick the tongue. It, it never overwhelmed. In other countries, their food is mouth hot. The whole mouth is hot. With us, it's just a pricking, which means that we can still appreciate the coconut milk. We can still appreciate um, matamis tamis or sweet. We can appreciate sourness. All of these things all at the same time with the anghang. So we have to become very familiar with what is our earlier flavoring. Now it's confusing because we are now buying, um, we are now buying all these different kinds of chili sauces and we're putting all these chili sauces into our, into our food. But that's not the traditional way that we did it. We, we didn't put the anghang into the cooking. We had, we had the anghang in the, what you add afterwards, in the dipping sauces. And there you could control how much anghang or how much saltiness or uh, how much sweetness you want to add to your food. Uh, whereas in other countries, the food comes to you and you don't alter it. If it comes to you hot like that, that's it. You eat it like that. Uh, Pikansi, if you want, it's anghang. It's maanghang, you eat it like that, generally. You know? uh, but with us and some of our neighbors, okay, some of our Asian neighbors, we add what we want. If we want it to be more maanghang, then we add. So we have to appreciate that our food is a do-it-yourself, a do-it-yourself uh, kind of meal. In truth, you, you shouldn't have a bad meal if it's a Filipino meal because we have all those additional, this is the additional salt in the bagoong or in the paho, paho mango that's brined. Uh, if you want it more sour, you can put this kind of, let's say you want coconut vinegar or you want to have kasui vinegar or you want to put calamansi or you want to put dye. All those souring agents taste different. If we educate our, 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 our sense of, uh, of taste. And in addition, you know, the Filipino food should not only be reckoned by, by sweet, sour, salty, you know, that sort of thing. It has to be reckoned by textures. Isn't it the Filipino? I don't know, we're always touching everything. And when, 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 I was with, um, when I was with an art museum, oh, we had to design exhibits so that in the beginning, people could touch everything. They could touch all the, the textiles. They could touch everything that was being used in the tapestries and all of that. Because otherwise, 
they want to touch everything on the wall you know of textile art they want to touch it but they weren't made to be touched isn't it us when we see friends right away you know we, we, we touch our friends okay other cultures don't do that when we're buying fabric we really touch it you know we turn everything inside out because we're tactile our taste our, our, our food is tactile. Think of the kare kare. I always tell people, kare kare, the, the uh, early recipes of kare kare, the way we grew up with it, it was almost bland. It's almost bland. It was a symphony of textures. The oxtail had to be so soft, very, very soft. And the flavoring came for us, our version, with the bagoong. The bagoong had to be really good isang bagoong. And that is what added the flavor to the textural uh, symphony that is the kare-kare. So when you eat Filipino food, and if you go to some of our wonderful uh, heirloom chefs, uh, we have a lot of male and female cooks, who are now using, they, they will not depart from their old way of cooking. They stand for it. When you eat the way they cook something, try to figure out what is the texture? How many textures do I have in the way it's cooked? When I add, do I change the texture, not just the taste? Because Filipino food has to be valued for its taste and its texture. And when you get a Filipino meal, isn't it? You, we tend to eat family style. We tend to order many, many different kinds of things and then rice. And then on our plate, we put many, many different things all at the same time. Um, that was what we used to call, that was once called ginawa. The feeling of joy came from all those many, many things. This is recorded. This is recorded and it's recorded way back, like in 1600s and 1700s. That's the way we eat. And why do we eat like that? Because we don't want to suffer from food boredom. And on our plate are different textures, different tastes, plus all those salsa ones, plus a ripe mango, plus a ripe banana. That's how we eat. We want every flavor to awaken in our mouth. We want to be beguiled by our food and we want to be happy. All those different things. So you have to understand that's our food. So you know how to under so you know how to answer. You know how to answer. And you say with pride, our food's not quite the same as yours. This is how we eat because we don't want to have boredom. Many things. See. Imagine people are eating abroad. I've seen this. They're eating ukoi in a street fair, and then they've got ice cream. These are Philippine filams eating crispy, greasy ukoi. That was how that one was. And sweet, soft, isn't it? Creamy ice cream. And it, then I go, you're really Filipino. You don't even know it. <laughs> so try to rethink try i beg of you try to rethink our cuisine so it's not defending it it's believing in it our food is parallel to the way our indigenous people dress the way our colonials in manila dress pattern upon pattern Texture upon texture. Our music, isn't it? It's also a blend. Our food's like that. There's nothing wrong with it. That's us. That's us. <laughs> Eat more. <laughs> Eat more variety. Go to places like um, Lilian, Aching, Lilian in, in Pampanga. No? That's the closest to me. But they're, they're, they're 
other places, in Quezon, in Batangas. There's, there's a good guide now. Clan Garcia has this. Um, it's on my Facebook. You can see it there and on my IG. Clang has this guide, simple guide to where you can go nearby. And then that's all uh, traditional cooking. That's not cooked with the mixes. And by that, you know, when you have that traditional cooking, you know, you're going to appreciate the ready-made more. You'll be discerning and you'll say, this one tastes more real, more quote authentic, more old-fashioned than some other brand. No, vinegars, you will learn how silky a vinegar can be. And then you'll say, mm, no, this one, bata pa ito siguro, hindi pa siya, this is not really a refined vinegar. You have to develop your own taste. Thank you, ma'am. Um, <laughs> last two questions. Um, this one from Sarah Jessica Wong. Is there a comprehensive or even partial bibliography of Philippine published cookbooks? I'm planning to write on health and nutrition during the American period for my thesis, and cookbooks are among my primary sources. Um, well, yes and no, in the sense that I have a listing of, the, of um, cookbooks from 1915, which is, I think, the earliest published here, up to about 1949. It's in a paper that I wrote that has been published, I think, in the Manila Studies. If you contact me, um, send me a PM on Facebook or message me through IG, and then I'll give you the citation. So, so you can start with that. And it includes what's extremely important to remember, the home economics textbook, textbooks, especially the 1922 edition. The 1922 edition, you'll be amazed what's there. It's everything from native uh, kakanin to birthday cake, and then there is um, sinigang, tinola, adobo, all of this. This is American period home economics textbook, pre-Commonwealth. Home economics actually helped us sustain our food identity. Every single girl in the country who was taking home economics had the same textbook. And sometimes the textbooks would have a few regional or, or provincial, you know, special dishes. But it helped define home economic, the home economics textbook helped define for the Filipino what was Filipino cooking. The partner, which you mustn't miss out, and I'm not sure if it's in that, that paper, is the 1938 Adult Education Recipe Book. A copy is at Lopez Library. I think it's online. That is the parallel to the Home Economics textbook. Home Economics has measurements in cups and tablespoons. Adult Education, is for those who maybe didn't quite finish elementary school, but who were good cooks. And here there are a few regional dishes again. And the spread of both is what probably your paper needs to have. The spread of the home economics textbook all over the archipelago and the spread of the adult education um, program around the country that I have a paper, it's published. So again, remind me and I'll send you because it tells you uh, by 1940 something, how many people were using that adult education recipe book. I don't know if you're going to also look into, um, there's so many handouts. 
You know, the food demonstrators, I have originals here. And those were very important side by side with recipes in um, the newspapers and the women's section of newspapers and the women's magazines that were put out by the uh, Women's Club, Federation of Women's Club, to parallel the Sufahista movement. So there's this material, contact me. Anybody else doing a research project and wants a little bit of help, contact me, Facebook, PM or IG. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Actually, there is a lot of questions, pero sinama mo ko na po yan since the person is trying to specialize on the topic. You can and, uh, send me the questions later and then maybe... Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, last question po to wrap up this session. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, did food factor into the making of the Filipino nation across various colonial periods of our country, i.e. gastro-nationalism, um, well, how shall I put it? Uh, I would say yes, but I would have to really do the research to prove what my gut feel is. Um, I always cite, and it's in the Adobo book that Claude Diag has just put out, it's at the end, where I note that when Rizal visited Blumentritt, so we're talking of the, the 1880s, just before coming home to the Philippines. Blumentritt hosted Rizal and Viola. Imagine, believe it or not, with Filipino food. And he had adobo and pancit and paella. Um, kare -kare. But how did they learn? How were they able to cook all that stuff there? Who cooked for him? Nobody knows the story. But it's documented that that is what he served. So already there was some sense of this by this guy that these are the, you know, this is this is Filipino food. Okay. So that's one identity type thing. The the other the other thing is during the Malolos um, Congress, when they hosted a uh, lunch and a dinner to uh, rat ratify the proclamation of Philippine independence. There is a menu there and they write it in French. And this, Ambit has written about it. I've written about it. Um, I think uh, maybe Jose Victor Torres has also written about it. You know, how, how the food became a representation of our being able to sit at the same table with any, any dignitary and that we could cook food. I mean, we cooked for the Cambodian king, we cooked for the Prince of, Wales, uh, of, of England, you know, I mean, why can't we, we, we sit at the same table and cook for you guys, you know? Um, so yes, on that score, it was, it was a way to prove that yes, we belong with you. We're on the same level as you guys, you know, don't look down on us just because of the color of our skin, okay? And then during the American colonial period, there was in effect a, uh, I guess like a kind of tug of war. What recipes were they going to put in the, in the, in the home economics textbooks? What were they going to um, to uh, recommend as nutritional food? But American food never made it here. Partly because by our our own home economics graduates were pushing for our food. And if you read uh, Pura Villanueva Calao, she really says in her Decalogue at the start of her little recipe book that was translated in different languages, she says, eat our local fruits and vegetables, eat local. It's what grows best. It's ours, eat local. Doesn't that sound like now 
We're saying, eat the local stuff. Help the farmers. Eat what the terroir. Eat what the terrain. Eat what the landscape gives us. And protect the landscape. Because that's our best source of food. That's our identity. We won in the home economics. We won. Thanks to all of those, those, those anonymous teachers, you see. Okay, thank you very much, Mom. And I hope everyone learned a lot so much <laughs> today. And th there's a lot of questions here still coming in, and we'll be sending them to Ma'am Felice to us. Uh, address them. So, for now, so, how to get in touch with them? Pag puro anonymous, yes, paano ko naman isasagot yan? Hindi aabot sa inyo yung sagot. Mayroon naman pong mga name dito. Oh, sige. <laughs> for now, kasi we're running out of time na po. And to wrap up our session, okay, I'd like to promote our social media pages. Intramuros Administration is on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you missed any of our previous episodes or if you came in late today, you can still view them in our YouTube channel. And please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. <laughs> I would also like to enjoin everyone to help Intramuros claim a back-to-back -back win for the Asia's leading tourist attraction. To vote, please go to https www.worldtravelawards.com slash vote or scan the QR code below and register to create an account. Then wait for the confirmation email to verify your account. And then to cast your vote, select Asia from the region menu. From the list of categories or outstanding votes, choose Asia's leading tourist attraction, number 119, and vote for Intramuros Philippines. The deadline of voting is on July 23. 2023. And uh, very timely for our topic in the Filipino Food Month, we already have a night food market in Fort Santiago. The Mercato Central is open every Thursday to Sunday, 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. And in connection to this, Fort Santiago is already open until 11 p.m. every day. But please note that the last entry will be at 9 p.m. And Clean Tramuros, our community-driven cleanup drive is also continuous. So, tuloy-tuloy po ito. So, for those who are interested to volunteer, please stay tuned to IA's Facebook page and other yes. online channels for the registration link and schedules. And for the latest updates and announcements about Intramuros, join our Viber community by scanning the QR code here or going to bit.ly slash IA Viber. This is also posted on our social media accounts. And lastly, our online exhibit at Google Arts and Culture is still up, so you may check our digitized collections there. So that is all for now. Maraming maraming salamat po uh, sa lahat ng dumalo at kay Ma'am Feliz. At magkita-kita po ulit tayo sa susunod.